Welcome to the Collingwood Rant. I'm Sly. And I'm just by the skin of my teeth, Spook. Spook, we just beat the might of the North Melbourne Football Club. Did we win by 10 goals like we predicted last week? We predicted we'd lose by 10. Well, you do that every week. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what do you think of this game? <laughs> um, you want to be positive because we won. However, I found um, pretty much the first half and the bulk of the third quarter inexcusable. Um, it was looking pretty much like we were out there to best the loss to West Coast Eagles. But to their credit, in the last quarter, they dug themselves out of a shit pit and um, ran over the rampaging might of the kangaroos. Should give them credit. North was really good. I know, I think that's a fair statement, too. I actually think they were pretty good. Um, Davies, Uniaki Smashed us in the clearances. But then again, I think you and I could smash them in the clearances. In fairness to Collingwood, I am really good. Uh, and Nick Larkey, with the service they were getting, very little pressure moving forward, ball, you know, going out into space, uh, undersized in defence, were killed in the air. That's the first time, um, well, the first time in a long time I've, I've been to a game. But to see um, Larkey up close, and I don't watch that many North games. I mean, I think I've got better things to do with the inside of my eyelids. Um but geez, he's he's everything I think we should be chasing. Instead of uh, Mc McHamburglar, what's his name? Mc McStay. Mc McStay. Well, maybe uh, maybe he should. Well, that's what we wish. Um, last quarter. Yeah, let's cut to the chase. Oh well, look, well, three quarters they killed us. There's, there's not a lot more to say. Um, Josh Dacos probably the only shining light. Yeah, that's very good. Yep. Um, last quarter, it turned around. I think the, the the main difference was, and you could see it clearly um, throughout those first three quarters. It's just there was no intensity there, um, and like I remember saying to you that you know look, uh, the first half of Carmichael's debut was was inauspicious to say the least, and you sort of got the sense of did we go a little bit hard? Were we um, smacking of arrogance? We just thought we'd they had to turn up was going to be enough today because every man and his dog for the last eleven games I think thumped them to the tune of nine hundred goals. Did we take the game a little bit too lightly? I don't think probably internally we did. I mean, but the, maybe collectively they they were flat across the. the there was board. one point you made early in the game um, while you were sober that um, <laughs> I actually didn't drink the game. Oh, okay. There was one point you made early in the game that so we had two outs, Darcy Moore and Jordan Degoe. Yeah. And very quickly you come down to the pack because you're bringing in guys like Carmichael who's, you know, first game debut. If it wasn't him, it was going to be someone like Polter or McRae who doesn't have many more games behind them. And then in defence, it was... Rusko, I thought, I thought it was pretty good oh, again. You, yep. you know, but how came back, how for more. So you sort of swap. He's still very undersized oh, yeah. like, defence. Yeah, standing Larky, there was no one that was going to compete. And, and throwing Goldstein back there, and he clunked a couple. Um, we just had no one that was going to counter it. All and you could see that right from the first bounce. Yeah. That, you know, it, and it really shows that our best 22 is probably our only 22 at the moment. And the shortfall when you take a couple of key players out is just how much you, as you said before, you, you just brought back down to, to, well, to the pack. You look at midfield, midfield got killed. So it really showcases that vacuum in there. And in, in that vacuum in the list, so you're still hoping that, well, I should say still, but McRae still very inexperienced. Yeah, I think Tyler Brown will take the next step. I think they've probably said with Callum Brown, we know what you've got and we're going to move forward. Um, it's really funny because I remember like about three, four years ago when we were doing this, we had like questions from viewers and one was how does our midfield look for the future? And it was like at that time with Trelaw, Stevenson, Tom Phillips, Braden Sire, Nick Dacos to come, you thought, yeah, they're pretty well set for about the next 10 years. And you fast forward three years, Nick Dacos is obviously a freak. Um, Trelaw's gone, Phillips is gone, Stevenson's gone, Sire's gone. So very quickly, an area where we thought we had depth is just empty. And it, it's funny, like because you, you've spoken about it before, but you think one of the immediate fixes will be to throw Maynard into the, into the middle because he provides you with, with some run carries, some aggressiveness. Uh, a little bit of inside work. It, it's all the things you think you, you'd need, but they're obviously very comfortable with where he is. And you sort of think, well, some of these positions should be 
grounding for you to get time in the midfield. And I don't recall any time that he's ever actually been. No, I mean, I thought, in there. the one thing I'll say with Maynard at the moment is when you have a defensive six, which is how fine experience, but then Rusko, Murphy, Quaynor, Nick Dagos, it's really inexperienced, you know, and John Noble. And John Noble's had a really good six weeks or so, but yep. again, it's still a really inexperienced defensive six. So they might be thinking, look, that's, that's working. Let's not screw with it too much, especially when we're losing guys like Darcy Moore. But when you get him regularly smashed in the clearances, you would think that you'd maybe try something a little different. I would have thought McCreary was the guy to go to. Well, he's another one from the opposite end that you could easily throw in, I think. And again, maybe it's a question of his tank or, or whatever, whether you could run out games from there. But like, you know, he's good on the burst and all that sort of stuff. You'd think it would be at least time to give him some midfield time. Oh, look, in terms of the midfield, particularly with that side we played at the moment with the goey out, I would honestly have said, look, to McCreary, we're going to start you in the midfield a couple of times. Um, to Ginevan, you're going to go in a couple of times also. Just, you know, get you a bit more involved from the onset, see what you can do, and just to give you a look. And it's also... We could drop the knees in a different part of the ground as well. Yeah, I mean, we'll go on to that in a minute. So I, I think they could have tried a few different things. They were getting slaughtered. And we've seen that the whole year. There's times where the opposition's midfield just waltzes it out and we yeah. have no one. So North made us look second rate in that area too. But the first three quarters, they were carving us up. But a number of teams have done that, which long when they overran us, you know, six goals down, we weren't touching the ball. They were just waltzing it out. So regardless of who the players available are, we are not setting up correctly to counter that. And there should be some sort of fallback plan where we go, okay, they've got a bit of a run on, we just need to kill it. We need to sort of have five minutes of just, you know, stoppages and kicking back and forth and just slowing it down. And they're not setting up that way because it's just the opposition get a run on and then bang, you know, it's like we're gone. Mm. Um, out of curiosity, what do you think of the umpiring? Fucking woeful. There were some seriously baffling decisions there. And look, it's, it's you know, I think you get a little bit of a get out of jail free card when you win the games and you, you clearly wouldn't point to it to say it's a reason why we lost. But... I just don't get some of the the calls that were made. The the Goldstein one jumping in Grundy's back was ridiculous. Grundy, uh, Grundy does. Nice. Yeah, well, next time he plays, he can jump into his back as well. Into into Cox's the ruck, back. The ruck rule's broken, and it should have been fixed well before this. That they've let it get this far, where people and I've said this for years, that you have both sides and commentators going, we don't know which way this is going to go, shows how fucked up that rule is or that interpretation is. Because surely a free should be like, everyone goes, yeah, we know what it is. We know what that was for. But instead of the ruck, everyone just running going, well, what is it? And Cox was clearly fucking flabbergasted that, well, I stood my ground and didn't move at all. And then he decided to jump on my back and I'm called for blocking. <laughs> what do you want me to do exactly? <laughs> but you're not allowed to actually ask that question because you give away 50. Oh, that's the other absurdity, you know. And, and this... You saw, um, just to go off on a segue for a moment, there was, um, during the Brisbane game yesterday, there was one of those moments where, um, I mean, it was a ridiculous free that was paid, and Mitch Robinson's reaction was, he just went, yeah, pretty much, Fah! and then put his hands over his face to disguise the fact that he was, uh, he was having a moment. And you think, that, that's a ridiculous look in itself. It shouldn't come to that. I think you should be okay to, to ask the question why, if, if for nothing other than to learn the reason why, so maybe that you go and do it again. If you can't engage with the umpire and find out why you've been um, given a free against, well, what's the fucking point of having the rules? You, you, you've got to know what it is you've done wrong. I Look, I understand why they're making the umpire so sacrosanct you can't fucking say anything because they're worried about the next generation of umpires. Well, maybe be competent at your job. That might help. That would help, but I actually think it's a ridiculous stance. Why can't you fucking turn around and say, hey, what was that for? And people go, would you do that to a cop? Yeah, if I got pulled over, I'd say, what was his ticket for? If it was a ridiculous ticket, I'd, I'd go to court and fight it. So don't sort of give me these ridiculous parallels mm. that you wouldn't do it in that situation. If umpires can't turn around and just go, well, I gave her this... I'm not going to reverse it, bad luck. Because we know, that, that, that no. prior decision is never going to be rich. So it's fine. It should be like, yeah, hey. And I can understand if they remonstrate too far, then the other guys, well, that's taking it too far. Now I'm fucking going to ping you for 50. That you cannot say anything in the heat of the moment, in a high pressure game, where something goes against you and you go, what the fuck? Which is just an exclamation of frustration. But that is suddenly turned into a penalty. It's ridiculous. And people who defend it are fuckwits because you should be allowed to find you know, the reason why you were pinged for something and to get clarity on it. 
And you see the best umpires historically, you know, in all forms of games, like you see it in rugby, where the umpire goes, well, this is what I've given it for. And they can actually make the player understand, the player goes, okay, all right, fine. But that you can't even ask that question anymore is fucking ridiculous. I mean, Mason Cox, you, you can just maul the fuck out of him. And the moment he stands his ground, it's like, well, that's a fucking ridiculous... Yeah, there's a couple of times. This bloke's 19 foot tall, where in the contest, he pitches forward. Now, I don't think he's a player that does that deliberately. He's clearly being pushed out of the contest. And they let it go every time. Yeah. It, it, it would take a fair effort and a fair bit of impact to... to you know, look, he may not have the greatest centre of balance going around, but it's a fair bit of uh, human to move over. And when you've gone that far forward, you've taken some form of impact. It's just nuts that they just don't. Well, so I recall there was one with Noble on the boundary where he was chasing the ball, sort of jumped, and he got just shoved in the back over the line, and that was like fine. There was nothing there. There was a number of really ridiculous free kicks. And then you gave it to Jack Ginnivan, who apparently you can just poleaxe in the head. Well, the AFL's okay at all this, so we've got nothing to complain about. But no, it's, I mean, look, sorry, Jack, you're the only player who does it in the league. We've got to stamp this out. No, no, no one else does it, apparently. I don't mind the AFL coming out and saying, like, you know, the contentious one that was the worst was the the holding the ball one where uh, apparently um, dropping to the knees is prior opportunity now. Um, I, I'm glad the AFL has pointed out that that's the case because I expect to see that now about 30, 40 frees paid this weekend across different teams. That'll be happening, won't it? No. Well, uh, interestingly, the amount of times I see this happen elsewhere and commentators don't commentate, uh, they don't, you know, elaborate on it. They don't focus on it like fucking Brian Taylor and Anthony Hudson who then have to go on. And look, I'm just going to call the pricks who are pricks. It's like the amount of commentators, you know, Hudson, Gary Lyon, and they're like, oh, he's done it again. And when they showed the replays, oh no, that one was actually fair. It's like, then you're fucking wrong. And you should actually apologize for perpetuating a myth. There's and I'm not saying he doesn't do it. Ginnivan does it, no, but no, he called on every single fucking one. plenty of other players are doing yeah. it too. Oh, Selwood's made a 15-year career out of it. And, you, know, you looked, um, there was an incident in the Carlton game where Fisher done the same thing. He got, um, he got tackled, he's dropped down out of it, he's got taken high and he's got it. Not a word was said in the commentary during that. And yet, I had to, when I watched the replay, when I got home, you've got Jonathan Brown talking about the Ginnivan rule. Yeah. Yeah, you know, they've, they've labelled this now as this is the guy that's responsible for the greatest blight on football. And up until him putting a jumper on and running onto the, onto the ground, this was never a problem. Oh, no. you, know, you had Selwood, who was the poster child for doing it for 15 years, yeah. but you know, we're going to do nothing but respect him because he's won 28 All Australians and 14 grand finals and captain, uh, who are they? Uh, yeah, I don't G, know. G, 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 whatever. Um, but. He's diefied for it, you know, and like there's no denying he does it. He's but he but then people argue it's his technique. He actually just oh, he drops and he and he lifts the elbow up and he pushes it into 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 place. I think well, doesn't matter. Each one that they're doing is a tactic. Well, it's interesting that the AFL came out and backed the umpires. Meanwhile, like I was watching the Sunday Footy Show, Matthew Lloyd yep. came out and called them and said, Dumby and Carrot. And and Matthew Lloyd actually said, you know, you can't have a situation. I think actually Damien Barrett said it. You can't have a situation where one one player is being umpired differently yeah. from everyone else. He's singling an individual out. Which is what's happening. It's discrimination, you know. Uh, and then Brent Harvey, who's part of North Melbourne, he actually came out and said, they're all there, all those free oh, kicks are there. They were all there. Yeah, so they, the AFL need to work out, well, hang on, if this is something you want to stamp out of the game, and you've got to fucking every single person you think who does it, then you've got to start penalising the way you're doing Ginevan. But I will actually say to Ginevan, and we sort of discussed this earlier, is, mate, What's the other tricks to your boat? Mm. You know, just fucking start just, you know, keeping your feet. Don't ever give him an excuse to condemn you. And then when these things happen, you know, come out in the month's time and go, I have not done that once and I'm still getting pinged. So if you can't actually tell when I was doing it and when I wasn't doing it, then maybe you weren't fucking getting a ride in the first place. Mm. Um, in terms of like McCreary, Bo McCreary, we've been a fan club for him and the way he ping pongs around tackling players his ferocity there was a tackle we talked about um in the last quarter where the north player I forgot who it was had his head down and McCreary ran straight toward him looked like he was going to just run straight into his head and give him a free yep. and somehow McCreary ran past him but grabbed him by the collar and dragged him over the boundary and it was just it was like the the, the mania in that fucking tackle oh. was just he was instrumental, I think, in a lot of the turnaround in the last. The, I think in the last quarter, the intensity across the board lifted. Everybody rose to the occasion. And that's that whole thing, I think, that they're building about 
um, self belief when they get in these circumstances, but maybe just don't get into those circumstances and win games. There might be another way of doing it, dealing with it as well. But his acts were, were phenomenal in that last quarter. Tackling the the, the, the goal, he should have gotten the two, sec, should, have, should have gotten yeah. two. That second one, like the the lid went off in the stand. It obviously yeah. didn't miss by too much, but it was a great effort. Like and he was huge in that last quarter, and he's just going to be a, a, a as we said it before. He's the sort of player that people are going to hear footsteps when he's in the vicinity of, and I think that's a great trait to have to put a little bit of fear into in the, into the players because it'll make them second guess. I agree. And I just I got the the stats for the forwards. So McCurry's played thirteen games. He's got forty nine tackles. Just this game. Yeah. For thirteen games, and then you compare him with our others. So Oliver Henry's played thirteen games, only had thirteen tackles. So it's one tackle a game, which um, you think he's got to lift that side. I'm not expecting him to be the McCreary's level, but you got to do better than one tackle a game. Ginnivan, fourteen games for eighteen tackles. My check fifteen for twenty six. Hoskinelli at fifteen games for twenty nine tackles. So he was sort of hitting two. He was good this game. Jamie Lee at ten games for forty tackles, and then Jordan the goalie off rowing there. I mean he was obviously playing midfield time. Thirteen games for thirty five tackles. So there's guys in that forward line whose tackling pressure needs to lift. I'd like to see a little bit more offensive pressure in there, there, but I think it's also that thing where they. You see now that they're more than happy to let the ball go out because they set up on the outside to re counter in, and maybe that's a tactic to tell them, you know, not go too hard, just to get into a position yeah, where you I can think go it's, I think it, I think it's just not part of the game. Let me throw this player's name out. So I'm not, actually let me throw his stats out. Nine games, twenty three tackles. Who's that? Nine games, twenty three tackles. So he's getting a much better strike rate than Oliver Henry and Ginnivan, um, even my check to an extent. That's Mason Cox. Is it? Yeah. So if he can fucking tackle, I know he's got long arms. Then... Like a daddy long legs. Oh, look, I'd like to see Ginnivan. I mean, Henry, I've seen, he does tend to lope when the play doesn't directly involve him. He'll, he'll attack it when it's, you know, going for the ball. But then he lopes. It's like you see um, McCreary. It's like, well, that guy's 20 metres away and he's past someone that's 10 metres away and he sprints like, yeah. you know, it's a fucking Like the pilot. clappers. Yeah. He's got to, you know, he's got to defuse it. Meanwhile, Henry's like, well, that guy's four feet away. That's he's out of my reach. Yeah, and you, you see, um, Nick Dacos does the same thing. It's like he'll do a kick out, yep. and as soon as the ball's travelling, he's like a he's like the flash. He's chasing the ball to get into a position where he can still contribute to the next chain. Yep. And then even if he misses out, he still invariably just keeps running. And I don't expect every player to be like that. You know, yeah. And I don't think you're going to see Henry ever do it. But a little bit more effort would be good. Uh, that yeah. So. The conversation, obviously, is these guys who aren't tackling as much are getting more goals. So Mychek has 30 goals, Ginnivan has 28 goals, Henry has 21 goals, and McCreary only has a nine. So, obviously, there's yin and yang to both their games, and it's like you'd want, actually both sets, you'd want McCreary to get a couple more, and you want these guys to lay a couple more tackles, because outside of McCreary, there's none of that fanaticism in the forward line if it's not him, you know, so... Yeah. And Ginnivan should actually... If I was Ginnivan and I was getting hit in the head as much as he is, I would fucking want some payback. You go back to the heady days of 2010 where you used to have that manic intensity when it got into the to the forward line. They did everything to keep it locked yeah. in there and, and give themselves a scoring opportunity. 2018 was another similar one where you had that you know, frenetic yeah. rush that went in there and you had people dobbing up left, right and centre that were, were kicking majors every week in, in you know threes or fours or fives. Um, it, now it's just, it's yeah maybe it's a combination like I said before about whether they're they're happy to let it go out or whether they just haven't got that part of their game worked out yet. Well, Early it, days. Well, it's interesting when you look at twenty eighteen, and pretty much every forward ended up around forty goals or more. When you look at it now, so you have McCrory on nine, Jamie Lead on twelve, obviously he's missed games. Hoskin Elliot on nine, Mychek thirty, Ginnivan twenty eight, Henry twenty one. The goey playing as a midfielder more is on 12 goals. We're not going to have that same output, despite the fact we're much more attacking and, you know, goal-kicking team. So, a lot more inaccurate too. Yeah. You well, want to, I mean, look, you, you've got the stats out for the missed shots, but you would think that maybe that would lift some of those numbers up in terms of... I'd have to lift them up um, quite a bit though, but it's just, it just sort of interesting. And look, I know, like, this is actually an interesting thing. So on Twitter, I saw someone say... It's indictment on how weak the competition is that we're fourth. And then I saw someone else counter, well, I think we're actually much better than you think because in 18, 19, 20, we were finalists. 
and 21 we had the bad year obviously but we've bounced back and we're and his claim was we're a better team now than we were back then so what would you think are we, are, is our position an indictment on the quality of the league or are we actually a better team that we're giving you know I think there there is some merit in the in the quality of the league because you've got that real. I mean, I, I think it's it's moved out a little bit this week, but there was a massive loggerhead of about five or six sides on the on the same um, number of points. But clearly, that that yeah, there's probably two not super standout teams in Melbourne and Geelong, and then there's the rest of a very even pack that could fluctuate for the rest of the season. I think, you know, we're, we're, in some respects, we're punching above our weight. Um, how that's going to translate into finals when and if we get there, um, that's going to be the real big challenge. But at the moment, I think we are where we, we deserve to be. Oh, I think you're pretty much always where you deserve to be. I know, like, there's fixturing disparity and all that sort of stuff, but you talk about sort of Melbourne is meant to be the heavyweight and they're really struggling. Um, Geelong... They've been, they're always up there. So there's always a question mark on how that's going to translate into final. Mm. Fremantle is a team that's come up and Carlton's another team that's come up. But both those teams have also had losses where you're going, well, maybe not quite as good as... No, I, mean, it, I think Carlton gave up like, what, seven goals or something to the West Coast? And it's one of those things where it's hard to put certain games into perspective. Like, you know, we we had a good battle with, with Gold Coast um, that you sort of think, well, you know, the Gold Coast that good? Are we that ordinary? It's hard to gauge. You know, you, you won, that's the, the, the key takeaway from that week. And then the following week, they have that massive turnaround game against Richmond the last quarter and made up a 40-point deficit and, and rolled over the top of them. You're thinking, well, actually, that changes the perspective of our game a little bit more, that maybe they are a little bit more of a quality opponent. Do we underrate some of our games? I think the biggest problem with Collingwood is we overrate everything, but that's another story. But do we underrate certain um, performances because the outcome wasn't a, a blowout? Yeah, you know, when you have a, a quiet um, a little tussle and you have a um, not a, a huge margin in the wind, do you tend to underplay how important that victory was? Well, the one thing is, when it looked like we were going to lose to North, I wasn't actually as pissed off as I thought I'd be because it wasn't that we were both shit and we were just being shit up. They actually played really yeah. well. I know they played a sort of game where you think they would have beaten a lot of teams on that day. And it's historically... Even teams that have horrible, horrible years, you know, and they're winning like four games or whatever, there's always like a couple of games where they just, for whatever reason, they yeah. get their shit together and it all clicks. No. And you go back to like, for example, um, when Essendon had, you know, half the list suspended because of the supplement scandal. And I remember they actually played this just one really great game where they beat Melbourne. Yeah, Melbourne was just a Melbourne back then. They weren't like reigning premier. But the thing is, some you know, there's games where it just clicks for opposition. And... This was the game for North where it really clicked for whatever reason, whether internally they said we've got to do something, we've got to make a stance or whatever, or whether it was just, you know, totally organic because that Davies Uniaki had such a good game and Larky was having such a good game and then everyone sort of jumped on board. But like if we lost, I would have been annoyed, but it would have been like they actually just outplayed us for three quarters. Um, the really good thing is, I think, again, historically, Collingwood has regularly lost games that they shouldn't lose, which has then cost them later positions. And, you know, you go back to 06, I remember being like fourth and we played Essendon who were last and they beat us and that cost us a top four position. You know, you go back to 81, we lost the final round against Fitzroy, they were finalists that year, but that was like at home, it was a game we should have won, went from first to third, which pretty much cost our premiership aspirations that year. And going through our seasons, we regularly do that, we lose the games we shouldn't. And this is one where I think we should win, we're going to lose it. And at the end of the year, we're going to go, oh, we've only had won that game. And we actually won it. And so I was really impressed by that. Like, it really surprised me that we found that gear. Yeah, no, definitely. Do you think that guy, Nick Dagos, might be any good? <laughs> I was saying to you before, um, where uh, my son and I were sitting, um, it was just um, in the pocket, more or less. And we had that perfect view as, as Josh passed to him and he's there on the boundary. And where we were for the angle of the goals, that, that thing split the middle. It would have been geometrically perfect. And the ball didn't waver. It's just the whole technique that he has is just at this stage is you don't want to say flawless but it's it's superb um i look i seriously hope this lasts forever um this is just like a four um as, as a player to watch but he is sublime i'll tell you the thing i love about that that goal and I, and I put it on twitter too is he was fed the ball by josh 
he didn't panic. He just, he balanced himself and he was running toward the ballot, the boundary, but he was going, I've got time and space here. Mm-hmm. And from that point, it was like a lot of players would have said, I'm going to banana it, I'm going to hook it, whatever. He didn't. He just did a straight drop punt, took his time and just said, this is all the kick that I need. And honestly, like watching that goal, it was once he got the ball fed out, oh, I just thought, this is a better chance than not to be a goal because this is the way this kid plays. He recognizes when he should do, the, you know, the, the, the insane and when he should do the ordinary and all that. And he uses the right weaponry for it rather than, look, I reckon there's players who would have said, I'm going to banana that off my left foot or whatever. He didn't do any or just, of that. Or just drop it to the top of the square. Yeah. You know, and he really took the time to assess it. So you don't get that composure in a lot of guys that have played you know, 100, 200 games. He's, what, 17 games yeah. into his career. He didn't have like the high possession game that he's been having the last few weeks, but it was still a really influential game on the matter. He got moved up into the midfield. He, had, he also laid that beautiful tackle where he just fucking sprinted and grabbed, was it, oh, it was one of the tall guys, and dragged him down. And it was like, okay, you got his defense. Was it Was it Bilaki? Oh, it's like it was yeah. like, I don't know. Yeah, some North play. Yeah, but it was really pleasing to see him do both sides, the offensive and the defensive. Out of curiosity, and this has been a hot topic on social media, Jaden Stevenson. He was really good for us in the last <laughs> quarter. He, I saw Brent Harvey speak about him. Like, So his efforts in the last quarter were highlighted. Um... And it was, you you pointed out the McCreary one, he's sort of like just, you know, he's wrong-footed balance, off balance. Maybe like stopping the Hulk. Yeah. Um, but the thing with, Brent Harvey said, look, he's carrying a back injury, so I don't know how much that related. And he did get subbed out shortly after that. I saw a discussion going on where someone was going, well, this is obviously why we got rid of him. And then someone else said, well, no, he revolutionized our forward line in 2018. And North have been stupid enough to try and play him as a rebounding defender. And then someone else said, you know, he'll come good, just give him time. Where do you sit with that with Stevenson now that he's been two years in the North Melbourne system? And obviously North Melbourne are a much lesser team. You know, they've been getting smashed most weeks. And that's not going to be the best for most players. So it's one of those funny, look, I think that first year for us was was phenomenal. Um if he took the betting stupidity out of the second year, his numbers were... Statistically, he was better off. He was improving. I think if it wasn't for COVID and the disruption that it caused a bloke like him, we only we talked about this over the time that, you know, I don't think he was that sort of individual that functioned well away from home at this early age. Um, and I think everything had a detrimental impact. And I think he certainly would have been... Um, well, I think he needs a good side around him to perform at that level. He's not going to drag... Um, a side out. Yeah, he's he's a um, he's a compliment to a, to a good side. Um, his confidence, I reckon, at the moment is just just shot. He's in and out of that side. I don't know what role he's meant to be playing. Um, he was soundly beaten in most of the contests, um, but he was always life and body. That was it was inevitable. It's, it's one of those things. I personally think that if if he it stayed with us. We didn't have the COVID disruptions. I think his trajectory still would have been good and he would have been a hell of a lot of a better player. Um, that's not you know, saying that our system was the perfect environment for that. I think he just was so naturally talented, he still would have continued that, that climb. If you took him out of North and put him into a good side now, I think his contributions would, would quickly elevate. I wouldn't write him off at the moment, but he'd have to be teetering on the edge, though, at, you know, at North. I don't know, is he... Did he get a long contract with him? Are we paying him until 2042? I don't know. I mean, the, the, the two things I look at with him is what we saw at Collingwood, was that the only thing he could do? And was he going to get worked out or was he going to evolve beyond that? I think he would have evolved, but you know, he, so, he, he might have a different idea. No, no, I don't know. I'm just, that's open to speculation. So you don't know. I mean, that's with every player. Like every player comes in and they're a surprise. And then as they go on, the opposition go, okay, this is what this guy can do. This is how we need to work him now. So... Whether Stevenson would have elevated beyond that, evolved beyond that, don't know. We're not going to know that. Mm. Um, and the second thing is his off-field preparation, which is often under question or regularly under question. Now, how much one influences the other? You get players who obviously can be a little bit more, I don't want to say lax, but you know they can have a bit more of a relaxed attitude toward 
you know, the, the guys who don't live, breathe, and eat football. Now, how much of that contributes to his on-field malaise? I don't know. Mm. Again, at North Melbourne, as you said, you put him in a good side, it's going to be a totally different equation, but it's just, we know what he offered. Now, was that it? Was, is there more to come? He, when he was at Collingwood, he looked like he, he could be anything. And he looked like he would be a sort of guy who'd be you know, running through the midfield. I do recall Buckley, his coach at the time, going, yeah, you know, we can play him at halfback, we can play him on the wing, we can play him at forward. So they obviously saw him as a lot more versatile yeah. than just being forward. But that Collingwood unloaded him. And I know people say it was a salary cap thing. It's like, I don't think it was just a salary cap thing because he was a pick six and there would have to be more to it than just going, if we've got to dump salary cap, there's other players we can get rid of before a guy who should have a 10, 15 year career at the club. That they said, no, we're going to get rid of this guy. There's certainly got to be a lot more to it than what we know. Hmm. Waste of talent though at this stage. It's looking like. Well, that's a shame, you know. It's like he does have talent and, you know, he might be the sort of guy who says, I, it might have just come too easy for him too early. Hmm. And he might have said, well, look how good am I and I don't have to push beyond this because I'm naturally talented. But you don't know. I mean, and there's players, you know, like that in every sport hmm. who coast on their talent and then they get so far and it's like, well, it's too, hard, too much hard work now. Uh, reports that Grundy's on the market. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Then that came from Tom, Tom Brown. Tom Brown today. Um, um, is he related to anyone at Collingwood? Um, Callum Brown. Hmm. I think they spell their surnames differently. Um, I look. I don't know. Um, my gut when that came out today, because there's been um, a few people that have been trying to put two and two together. But when it comes from someone who's father happens to be in a position of uh, prominence at Collingwood you wonder whether that's an orchestrated move just to flag to the competition that he's potentially on the market and all suitors can form a line to the left now and, and show us what you're going to offer tell me what would you accept as a deal for him um first two round picks uh plus you take all his contract so you, is that serious because there's no way that's going to happen why not no so seriously what would you take if, if it was us looking for it we'd do that we have we have form there. Yeah, I know. But the bad thing is he's had two pretty mediocre years. He's coming off an injury, so opposition clubs are going to be entitled to say, well, how did we know he's recovered from this? Even if he comes back for like three weeks and dominates, opposition clubs might turn around and go... He'd have to go to a club that's that's completely devoid of a Ruckman. But what would you expect from that club in response? Well, or would you I just... still wouldn't expect the world. So look, let's assume that he's on a million a year. Um, if someone... Oh, look, I think you'd be picking up six, seven hundred K of his contract and we'd have to foot, you know, three hundred, say. Um, I don't think you're gonna to see too many picks swapping in the early part of the draft. You might see a couple of late ones or, you know, round twos exchanged or something. Um, you'd entertain it though. Wait, so And I'd entertain it for how old is he now? Twenty seven, twenty eight. Yeah. Um big men don't slow down, they stop. Oh, well, I've also said this with um, Grundy. I, I mean, I, I said it like when we first started the seven-year contract. It, it, he's a ruckman who bases his game on athleticism. So it's like Josh Fraser, Matthew Cruiser, when that actually stops, is he going to have anything left? Now, the one thing, you know, watching the North game and watching, you know, since Grundy's been out, Cameron and Cox takes mar take marks. Uh, Cameron took a really good mark up forward, which I just don't see Grundy doing. That's not part of his um, repertoire. repertoire. You know, he does take marks, but not like what I've seen. You know, Cox took five contested marks. So, you know, so he had like a quieter game, but he still took some really important marks. Like I remember we were going forward late in the last quarter and it was just, he just jumped up over the pack and just grabbed it out of everyone's hands. And mm. I don't see Grundy doing that. So the thing with Grundy is, do you think we're a better team with him playing at his best or do you think there's a trade-off? And I know in terms of, like I've seen the argument saying, oh, well, we got killed in the midfield. That wouldn't have happened without Grundy. It's like, well, did you not see the 2019 prelim where he won every tap and we still got killed in, that's, in clearances? And that's and that's not like, that's an isolated occurrence. No, that's no. been a, an ongoing issue. I don't And I don't know whether at this age and at this stage of his career is he going to correct these things now. Um, well, that's look, what... he's still got, you know, he's been robbed of a development year under, under the fly regime. So he may have turned a corner um, and gotten back to, to his best there, but we just don't know. Coming in, um, he's still, what, a couple of weeks away? You're coming into the arse end of the season. How much of an impact are you really going to have now? Um, his opportunities might be better um, elsewhere. 
the problem is always going to be the optics of what we did as a deal and the fact that we're balked on it pretty much quite very quickly 12 months later how many years he got yeah. left five or six so, i think it's on the second it year didn't start yeah the start of the yeah, year after he yeah. signed it so but you know it was what eight years the media and don't we love them They'll have a pull over this for about a month and then they'll forget about it and move on. So really, that's not a big deal. We'll ride that. And So would you let him go and go with Darcy Cameron as your principal ruck? I'd be very tempted to. And that's primarily to, to free up some cap space to bring the type of players in that we desperately need. Uh, key forward, another key defender, an inside mid would be the first things that I'd be looking at. If sacrificing Grundy would give you a good opportunity to, to, to get that type of player, you'd have to seriously entertain it. What about if it was like Grundy to GWS for Taranto and then there's some other stuff that swaps around? Yeah, I'd, you'd think about it. I mean, for me, like I've always said, you know, you can trade anyone as long as you get something out of it. My biggest question with Grundy is, okay, he's probably going to be a better midfield ruck, like someone who taps it to himself and get, you know, but you're going to lose stuff around the ground. Hmm. Cox and Cameron take marks around the ground. Now Cox is like 30, 31. So how much longer is he going to be around? And you rely on guys like Beg. Um, so it's at a point where you go, well, you might go to a Grundy and then Cameron gets injured next year and it's like, now you're in the shitter. So I, I, I don't know how they're going to handle it, but in terms of what they each bring to the team, Cameron and Cox play more traditional ruck mm. roles which is what I've always said with Ruckman Grundy is sort of better in the myth my big concern with Grundy is I think he's got fucking loads of talent but he's never shown me adaptability he's never shown me like oh this guy's playing with this so I've got to change the way I play to counter it instead he just sort of keeps doing the same thing and it's like alright you know I mean it already fucking Cox has played a few games in the ruck and he's gone I'm just going to punch it ahead because we can't clear their midfield yeah. and Grundy hasn't done that in you know seven years of rucking at the club mm. Um, so I just actually, I don't know, I find it fascinating, but that trade, if they're paying half his contract and all that for the next five years, it, it's really an indictment on the poor management of contracts. I mean, we don't know the, the, the content of the contract and, and, and at best it's speculation, but surely there has to be a large amount of performance-based triggers for that sort of money. You, we could be, but you, you'd hope we weren't that dumb just to say, here's a lot of money, go off and keep doing what you've been doing really well. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the longer contracts seem to be creeping in. You know, people are pointing at Franklin one because he's played actually the nine years that they contracted him he's, for. He's probably due for a 10-year extension. Probably, but it's, you know, and Clayton Oliver's got him what, seven at, at Melbourne. Seven or eight, what is it? No, yeah, wait, whatever it is, you know, which I just, I don't know. I'd, seriously, if I was running a club, I'd be really tempted to just go, I'm not doing this. Mm. Um, even, even with the Oliver one, yeah. Unless you think you're going to be in contention for the next eight years, what's the point? Well, the other thing... Surely you're going to have to, you know... And this is probably the, the mistake that uh, a lot of clubs make is that you fall into that romanticism of a one-club player. You know, probably a couple of years ago, we should have moved on steel side bottom when his value would have been through the roof because you're now looking at that next phase of, you know, yeah. of your team's development. Hanging on to the older boys while it's, it's good... But are they going to be part of your next flag tilt is the stuff that you could have probably impartially look at. Well, some of it's also like how many of these guys you still need to keep around and keep the framework of development. You know, you take Pendlebury and Sidebottom out of that team and we drop about six positions. Um, well, yeah, that's it. Mean, so it's, it's like it's a balance. I mean, I don't know. I mean, look, so I admit I got it wrong. I thought we were going to be a bottom six team. We've actually improved week by week. I still, we're in the I upside down. I don't think we're top four side. Um, we almost are it. Well, we are at the moment, but ultimately, I think we're like more of the way we're playing. But again, this is sort of the the loose nature of the the, the top eight. Melbourne's struggling, but you think they're going to be top four. Geelong's consistently been good. Fremantle's consistently been good, but still had a couple of hiccups. Mm. Where you go, oh, okay, and Carlton's very similar. And you think that would be your typically your top four, um, but like all those sides are falling over at different fucking points. And you think it's going to be more like one of those years, like 2005, 20, 2006, where West Coast and Sydney won flags, each one flags. And they weren't great sides. They were just sort of like the best of the rest. Um, best of the best. And now Melbourne might just get their shit together and just kill everyone. And that, they they have that capacity to do it. And like I don't see Geelong doing that. But, you know, 
someone can actually clip this and show at the end of the year after they win the flag? Yeah, I, I, at the moment, like I said to you before, I, I think they're probably, at the moment, the more likely to win a flag this year. Yeah, I, Christ knows they haven't given enough tries. Yeah, well, that's the thing. is like once they move away from wherever the fuck that stadium's called. Uh, what's, what, is there a sexual disease called GBH or something? I don't know. But yeah, you know... The, the, it's, it's an underarm problem, isn't it? And if you look at, like... They won the flag in 2011, apparently. And so Chris Scott's been there since 2011. And in every year since that, I don't think I've ever looked at them and thought, you're going to win the flag again. They've always sort of looked like that top four side who gets the prelims and loses against the better sides. And they got to one grand final and they played Richmond and I don't know, you know. I don't think they were ever really sort of seriously a threat to win that. They were like the outside chance. So, I don't mean, they always look to me like the best of the rest, you know. They have a lot of seasoned bodies out there at the moment that seem to be performing well. And they're going to require that towards the end for that to, to be a, a chance. They could drop quickly, but fuck them, who cares? I don't care. I mean, there's a few players in that side. If they were a couple of years younger, I'd go, fuck, yeah, definitely. Selwood and, you know, Dangerfield and all. You know, and Hawkins were like a couple of years younger. Yeah, shit, this is scary. Could but... you imagine Selwood and Ginnivan on the same side? How would that upset the commentators? Oh, probably like, you know taking the cruise on Titanic. Yeah, they'd have to wear like those blinkers that horses wear anytime Selwood went near the ball. I didn't see that one, mate. I didn't see it. Did you see what just happened? I'm sure it was a great moment of football, though. Um, we're playing Adelaide. Are we? This week. Where are we playing? In, over there. Um, in South Australia. Yeah. That should be good. When, when is it? Saturday Saturday, 1.45 or something like oh, that. That should be a beauty. Is it on the TV? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I can imagine it is. Uh, Scott Pillar replaces his 350th game. Yeah, I saw the merchandise. Oh, there's the merchandise out. Yeah, there's the SP350. Um, sounds like some sort of uh, um, engine oil. So what do you think? Um, against Adelaide? Yeah. Oh, I think ten we'll goals. win by 10 goals. Oh, you think we'll win by 10 goals? No, Adelaide will win by 10 goals. Oh, okay. Yeah, good on Adelaide. Uh, with the close calls against, or close call against North and the loss to West Coast, you think surely we should be on the alert for this shit? Oh, look, I, there's, there's obviously a loss coming. There's no doubt about it. And the thing is, you can't, um, and I think you touched upon it earlier, that as you get towards the tails of the season, you can't just look at the shit sides and think that's just a guaranteed win because sides lift this time of year. They'll have their us. moments. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's an inevitable thing is that the sides invariably do see us as a, I don't know why, um, reason to, to play better this week. Um, so I don't think... Adelaide's going to be an easy boat side. Yeah. We we should win. I wouldn't be surprised if we if we lost by ten goals. Yeah, I think that too. And you know, uh, really late stories. Andrew Cracker and Leon Davis return to Collingwood. Fantastic news. Well done. Yeah, to the club. Um, not bad for a bunch of. Um, can you say the R word? I don't know. Um, ro- ropists. <laughs> Wrote this. Wrote this. Um, yeah, so I think that's that speaks volumes about how internally uh, things are changing at the club. Um, and I think that's a really good story. There are two players that I'd loved watching um, during that period. And I, I, they're the ones you want to see come back, embrace what the club's becoming. I think that's also testimony to some of the, the changes that have happened in the last 12 plus months. To, to make this a little bit more of a, a destination, not just for players, but for, for all sorts. And I think they're doing great work in, 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 in getting, I don't want to use the word inclusive, um, but I think in this context, um, looking back at the, at the past and bringing that sort of thing in, they did something recently where the players brought the families in and they ran uh, for training and they did the kids did the, the water drills. And that's fantastic to see. I mean, you obviously wouldn't do it every week, would you? But um, every now and then, it, it's good to to really, I think you can be quite, especially in sport, you can be isolated in a small group of, of teammates and that becomes your world. It's important that, that your scope of vision sees other things around you. I think it makes you a better um, team person at the end of it all too by just not having that tunnel vision of, of, of what's your life essentially that you see other elements come in so it's good you weren't concerned like when they're doing some of those activities that some of the kids did hammies <laughs> no <laughs> final thoughts um I haven't really got anything I don't think so seven in a row 
Uh, no, well, that's fantastic. It's, um, you know, I wouldn't mind seeing them not drop a game for the rest of the year. Well, I said that, I think, after we won the first one <laughs> as a joke. Oh, look, the, the, look, I admit, like, you know, I kept saying we were bottom six team, and I was obviously wrong. The thing that's really impressed me is the way they've constantly adapted and evolved beyond, like, the shit that was happening, and they've addressed it. Hmm. You know, there was that article a little while ago, but out of the fence, they're going down the corridor, and they're getting caught out, and they've changed their game for the game wide now, coming out of the fence and stuff like that. So it hasn't taken them eight years to go, well, maybe this is not going to quite click, and then tried it again the next three years yeah I don't think that's a major difference especially with this regime is that steadfast stubbornness to just keep failing at something and hoping that one day it's going to work it's that whole thing about the definition of insanity is doing something over and over again expecting it to change I thought the definition of insanity was supporting Collingwood oh, well that's that too yeah so I'm really impressed that if they can address the midfield clearances because it's like I understand you're going to lose clearances because that's what happens but too often in games opposition just waltz out and you go back to that Geelong game we lost. Geelong did to us in the last quarter what North Melbourne was doing to us. They were just walking out with very little pressure and all that sort of shit. Um, so I look at it and go, "This you got to zone that up differently or you got to send someone in there who can... You know, they'll, they've been sending Pendlebury in there at, at times to try and add some stability and all that, but you're going to have to find some sort of counter to stop that. Look, they're good learning opportunities at this stage of a, a very early development phase. And the, the thing with that too is you might just be saying to the Ruckman whether it's Cox or Cameron, just go, you know what? Just run and just thump it. Just thump it 15 metres and just totally throw them off. And once you've done that once, then they've got to stop and go, well, what if that happens again? So it could be as simple as something like that. Maybe they should just give McCreary a giant mace and you can swing it like Sauron at the start of uh, Lord of the Rings and all the other players just go flying off in the... Uh, Robo Sauron. And then you can run through. I think mean, they should just put Ginevan in the ruck and then you can just... He could slide through. He could slide through. And, yeah. Anyway, that's it from us. And that's it from us. <laughs> oh, right through the ring. That was impressive. Uh, next oh, week. It's not something you'd say in a shower, though. <laughs> oh, my God. Later. See ya.